I suffered panic attacks every night from my fifth year in graduate school at Columbia University all the way through almost all of my second year as an assistant professor at Stanford University, where I teach now. I had panic attacks in the classroom, standing in front of my students and delivering lecture. I like to believe that they couldn't tell that it was going on because I had gotten very good at that point with somehow writing it, writing it out when it happened. I had it uh, while I was finishing my dissertation, of course, um, during the job search. It was a, just a, a daily part of my life for a good number of years. And I've never really spoken about it publicly. Um, my family knew, my close friends knew, my partners knew. But I realized when I do talk to my own students about this, and I I do talk about it openly with, with them. There's a sense of relief um, and also surprise that um, maybe this is as common as it is or, or maybe an assumption that if someone does go through this, then they couldn't, um, they can't succeed. They, 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 that people who make it to a certain level must be the ones who don't deal with these issues in their life. And I tell them that that's, you know, that's really not true. Uh, and um, I just thought that I would make this video. There really is no script. There's no outline. I'm just going to do my best to share with you my own experience, um, share some things that I learned along the way, and hopefully start a, a dialogue. Um, you know, around mental health, taking care of oneself in academia, and in particular, grad school, and uh, as a as a as a professor. So a little bit a little bit about myself. Um, I am a professor of history at Stanford University. I've been here teaching for fifteen years. I got my job fifteen years ago, straight out of. PhD. I, uh, I was a PhD in history at Columbia University from 2000 to 2006, and then I started at Stanford in 2006. And the memory is a little bit fuzzy, but problems, I mean, acute problems, the problem had been there for a long time, um, really erupted in 2005 and extended almost unbroken, I would say, into 2008, 2009. I, I, to this day, remember a massive international conference that I organized uh, called Critical Han Studies. It was basically about bringing critical race theory to bear on, on, on studies of race uh, and ethnicity in China. Um, it was a conference that was like hitting far above my weight as an assistant professor. I somehow managed to get a number of very heavy hitters to attend, to keynote, and so forth. It turned into an edited volume. What people didn't know is that behind the scenes, I was like falling apart, and I had been for a number of years. I remember taking the train home from the last day and um, just being in a state of exhaustion and uh, um, kind of near mental breakdown uh, and for a good number of uh, a good number of months, kind of sporadically over the course of that that time frame, two thousand five into two thousand, you know, eight nine time frame. Another thing that people don't know is that I was there were times in which I couldn't I couldn't work more than maybe just a few hours a day. I had basically cut my work down to like a fifteen hour work week. I had to just stop drinking coffee, which I know that doesn't sound like a big thing, but for me. Um, anyone who could imagine me physically not being able to drink my most favorite substance on earth, it just a sense, I mean, just a sip of it would trigger anxiety attacks. And, um, this was, you know, uh, just a, a core part of, uh, of, of life. The, uh, basically every single time the sun set as, as, uh, bedtime would near the dread, a kind of anticipatory dread would begin to set in. And I knew that it was coming and it felt like beyond my control. Um, but there was really nothing that I, that I could do about it. So that's 
a little bit about just the sort of the basic nuts and bolts of what went on, but I want to kind of zoom out and back up a little bit and, and, and talk more broadly. I think the first thing that often is discussed around issues of mental health, especially in grad school, but maybe for, it's certainly not limited, but um, is how common it is understandable it is, but sometimes how dangerous it is to be uh, uh, overly self-reliant. So I'm a bit of an autodidact. A lot of the videos that I make for this channel and on my TikTok channel really talk about how as a first-gen college student, you know, had to figure out a lot of things or, or thought I had to figure out a lot of things just on my own. I couldn't turn to uh, mom or dad for advice on particular things. But also, I, I do probably have an inclination to try to figure out things for myself from, from books, from videos, from references. But um, there's something about knowledge, for me, something about knowledge that is hard won through one's own actions that really somehow sticks with me more than um, having it, it explained to me uh, necessarily sticks in my mind. And that's, that's, a, that's an asset. I, don't, I, I think that's a feature of my life that has served me except in this case. Uh, when I had my first adult panic attack, and I'll explain why I use the word adult qualified it there, I had just moved into a new apartment, uh, really a shared house in Brooklyn, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where I was living, uh, commuting to Columbia. Um, and I had moved in maybe, the, I think it was like the first or second day, night or third night, a great roommates. I was so excited. I, I moved out of a really bad roommate situation. I was so happy in my new place. And, um, you know, there were some triggering, there was, there was a trigger that day. I won't go into what it is cause it's, it's a bit too personal, but, um, I had the classic, what I guess turns out to be the classic, uh, first experience of, of, a, of a panic attack, which is the belief that you are having a heart attack or that something is just inexplicably wrong and that it's in your body and that you feel like you might pass out and the fear that if you do pass out, you may not recover. Uh, I was, um, I was on a phone with somebody that was the triggering conversation. And I just said to them, I have to get off the phone. And then for some reason, the instinct hit me to call my mom just to not to get help. It was really to say, to tell her what was going on and that if something really bad was going on, I wanted, I don't know if I wanted her to know or the, co the comfort of it, but it was a, a bizarre thing to do. I, perhaps I called and, you know, she answered. We have a very brief conversation that I said, I have to get off the phone. I, I need to go to the hospital. And then I had the just mortifying moment of knocking on my new roommate's door at around midnight or 1 a.m. and saying, I don't know how else to say this. Can you drive me to the emergency room? I think I'm having a heart attack. She did. She was wonderful. Um, we still keep in touch today, but we went there. They ran tests. And then the doctor said, you know, you had a panic attack. It you know, feels like a lot like a heart attack. Uh, we've monitored you. You did not. And I remember just, I, I, I had a chance just to be by myself. Well, as, as, as by yourself as you can be in a New York City emergency room. And just starting to kind of quietly weep at what I have allowed myself to do to my own body, the neglect that I have allowed myself, um, with which I've allowed myself to treat my own body, that I'm here, that this is, this wasn't a heart attack. This was, this was the outgrowth of stressing a system to the point where this is where we end up. And I almost thought of my own body as like a, not me, but a, my, my child or a relative or someone I love. And just feeling this profound shame and sadness that I had mistreated someone I love in this way. But I did not seek therapy. I didn't then, the next thing I did not do was, you know, try to find therapy. I, and I don't, to this day, I don't really understand why. I believe in therapy. Um, 
maybe I grew up in a family of my parents I were like like many of their generation sort of very anti-therapy just saw it as more or less uh, an activity of turning people against their parents and turning people against their families or whatever it might be and why are we talking about this stuff you make it worse by talking about it um you know um congratulations you hate your parents so therefore you're saved you're cured all of these kind of cliches and um but i don't feel that way at all uh therapy helped me as a teenager i had one sort of early life crisis that it it really saved me in many ways uh and but i didn't turn to it and i don't know why i'm sure that somewhere in my first year introduction packet at at columbia i'm sure somewhere in that packet of papers there was something about health services or mental health services i'm sure if i had gone to a website somewhere at columbia that it would have been there but it at the same time and this is this is not faulting columbia this is not not taking responsibility it's not as if it was an active part of life i mean if it was in that packet that was the last time i ever heard about it um if if any one of my colleague my student colleagues took advantage of those services i never knew we never talked about it it just wasn't it wasn't in conversation it wasn't part of life and um and so again once again the the idea was i'm going to go it alone um i also i should say i have like a a kind of paranoia surrounding uh pharmaceuticals drugs uh anything that i i think that you know if i start if i start doing this thing will i ever be able to stop will i become dependent on it i'm very very fearful of becoming dependent upon outside objects uh um outside and 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 people it's it's a, it's a something that i work with something that i that i deal with it's not it's not a good thing necessarily i'm not saying it's a good thing but the idea of solving this or remedying this through some kind of medicine was out beyond the pale for me it was never was not even in my in my imagination um and so what that had set up me for was um literally one horrifying anxiety attack after the next after the next after the next do i regret not reaching out yes i would say that um probably one thing that i think we all need to do a much much better job of within grad school academia at large undergraduate increasingly high school increasingly is making it can't be just the first packet of information where mental health is highlighted or where these opportunities are are laid out it it needs to become part of everyday or every week conversation and that that takes a lot of steps from a lot of people it takes it takes actions from people like me i'm in a position of relative security i have tenure and so yes it is compromising for me to just share with colleagues and students my history with mental health but it but it's it it's incumbent upon me to do that because then it might open the door where a colleague of mine might share or make it open or just make it part of everyday conversation and therefore graduate students and students at large um and the goal is not to turn uh, uh, you know the university into to change the mission of the university into one that is fundamentally about um therapy and self-help it is rather to transform the university such that we don't understand we 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 no longer make this binary or boundary choice saying like we're here to do this and 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 all of that stuff we're going to we'll talk about it if 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 the siren goes off we're going to talk about this if the if if the tornado comes um because when the tornado comes it's too late it 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 it's, it would be so much better to make that part of our everyday conversations about our intellectual careers what we're studying um our coursework our preparation our professional development and just integrate it throughout not make it this strange exceptional thing you talk about only when necessary um because in many ways that that 
that forestalls these things, that, 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 that um, helps them not reach crisis proportions. And also very importantly is that when crisis comes, we have, you know, we have the emergency number in our, in our head, so to speak. We know where it is on campus. We know that it is an absolutely regular, normal thing to go and make use of it. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's the way, uh, that's the way it is. Now I know that this is, there are millions of issues tied together with this. Uh, there are lots of, um, really heartbreaking conversations and concerns about, you know, whether or not if a student in particular exhibits any, uh, issues with mental health, does that compromise their housing? Uh, for example, will they be required by the university to, move out of shared housing if, um, if, it's, de if it's decided that uh, the person is not in a, in a situation where they can you know, live with other people. And, and um, these are questions, of, there are questions surrounding funding and time to completion and what will my advisor think of me? And maybe this is just the normal part of the stress of grad school and that means I can't cut it. The point here is, is that I probably should have remembered at that moment about the packet I received at the beginning of my grad school career, but I didn't. And also, even if I did, there was no structure in place that would say that this is the regular next step. This is where you go. If you break your foot, you go to the ER and you go to physical therapy. Like that's what you do. Um, but with questions of mental health, we don't have that natural. This is the natural regular sequence of things. This does bring me to, I guess, the next part of the story, which is that over those years of daily, well, nightly um, panic attacks, well, without any, without the assistance, and I, and I, and maybe I, I could have benefited in hindsight from a little bit of help, um, pharmaceutically speaking, but um, to try to somehow navigate those years of nightly panic attacks without assistance, whether therapeutic or pharmaceutical, is I had to develop, just out of survival, I had to develop a, an awareness of my own self that I had never had before. Uh, I knew, I came to know with like precision what triggered it, what triggered the attacks. I came to be able to foresee the attacks coming I wasn't able always to stop them, but I, but instead of them just sneaking up on me with a minute notice or a few seconds notice, suddenly I, I, I could start to say, okay, if everything continues the way it's going right now, it's going to be here in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I could see the, for, <laughs> the four horsemen of the apocalypse kind of <laughs> coming over the, over the horizon. Um, and what that allowed me to do eventually, and this took a long time, this took more than, uh, it wasn't probably maybe until year two that I really started to be able to act on this, is then with being able to see it coming, I then started to be able to steer myself away from it, such that, uh, I mean, I'm, I always deal with, live with anxiety. The anxiety itself has not gone away but now, by and large, I can see it coming and I can correct course. Whether the situation I'm in or my self-narrative, my air narrative inside of my head, the way my body is positioned, uh, just a lot of different factors that I came to be aware that I could adjust them and the attack would never arrive. And... Um, you know, one day would become a week of no attacks, would become a month. And now I've been attack free for years. That doesn't mean I'm calm now or that I'm done with anxiety. I'm not. But I have since built up this kind of repertoire arsenal. The other thing that I learned, and I credit this to, my, um, to a roommate of mine at that same place, that same house in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, not the one who brought me to the ER, yet another one. It's an amazing house, full of amazing people. Uh, I remember I was watching a movie with her. It was like, we were just hanging out. Um, and uh, she was smoking. And she said, you know, do you want, you want some? And I said, sure. 
And I thought to myself, you know, okay, coffee's off limits. Uh, you know, I'm trying to watch that. But for a moment, I just sort of let my guard down. And I was like, and I, and I also wanted it to be okay. I wanted to believe that I was in a situation where I could just be my, my normal self, whatever that meant, the time before the anxiety. And I said, sure. The moment I took it from my lips, and in case you're wondering, I'm not talking about cigarettes. The moment I took it from my lips, I turned to her and I said, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I should have known this. I think I did know this, but I am going to have a panic attack. And like, I was apologizing because it's like, you didn't sign up for this tonight. You know, you're just, we're just watching a movie and now I've made, there's, like, you know, there's so much embarrassment that surrounds it. You, you, again, being dependent on other people is not a feeling I like. I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a panic attack. Like, it's definite. There's nothing I can do. And she, she just said, um, it was amazing. She said, well, you know, I, I had panic attacks. We had talked about it some before that, but she revisited it. She said, I had panic attacks throughout my teenage years, like from 13 till this. And, well, you had them. You had a bunch before. You know you're not going to die. You know you might pass out, but that's the worst that's going to happen. Like, you know in your head intellectually that you're fine. And so um, just go through it. Just go through it. And what ensued over the next 30 minutes, I would say, was one of the... It was my... 20 something year old, nowhere near Nirvana, Brooklyn, under the Bodhi tree enlightenment moment because I was watching this movie. I was on a couch in Brooklyn, but at the exact same time, I was 35,000 feet up in the sky on the top of a raging, speeding dragon up in the stratosphere who was like whipping and diving and curling. Um, so physically, I was safe on this couch. And then at the same time, I was on the most horrifying roller coaster one could imagine. And so I was in both places at the same time. And I tried to understand what that meant. Uh, and I hit this little moment, and I'll share it in case this is of any use to anyone watching. And by the way, I am not recommending that people avoid therapy, go to a therapist. And I'm not saying I'm proud of myself for not helping myself with some sort of uh, prescribed medicine. No, if, if you need it, that's what that's what you need to do. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just that I made the choice I did. I was on this flaming dragon. And I remember thinking to myself, there are two ways that I feel like I, I'm, I, I, I every now and then lose my balance and I fear falling off where the panic, where, where the panic is really dominating as opposed to Tom is having panic as opposed, you know, versus panic is having Tom. The first of these was, I guess what you could call fear. It's like gripping like, <gasps> like that. Uh, and I, the way I overcame, cause then you fall backwards off the dragon and you fall 35,000 feet to your, to your perceived death. Well, I thought to myself, this dragon doesn't want to die. This dragon knows how to fly. It's kind of like being in the backseat of a taxi with a New York city taxi driver, like a really, really seasoned one. They're kind of crazy. They're like whipping through traffic. They're doing all this stuff, but you also like, I feel totally calm in those situations. If like my dad drove like that, he was a kind of a bad, not a very good driver. I would feel scared out of my mind. But when a New York City taxi driver, somehow it's like this guy knows what they're doing and doesn't want to die. Like they, they have self-interest as well. Um, so here we go. And I thought to myself, this dragon doesn't want to crash. This dragon knows how to fly. Um, so... There is zero, is all I have to do is sit here and, and just hold on to this thing and, and I will be fine. It will end. But then there was this other danger of falling off in the opposite direction, which was cockiness, um, over self-confidence of like, well, yeah, look at me flying this dragon. And that's this sort of energy. The posture would be sort of like leaning forward, like I'm on a, like I'm on a motorcycle and I'm so cool. 
Um, and you do that and suddenly you lose balance again because it's whipping around and, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I am not riding this dragon. I am not riding this dragon the way I drive a car. This dragon is in charge. It doesn't want to die. It knows how to fly, but I should be under no illusions that it is in charge. I think I just quoted. Uh, yeah, I think I just quoted a line from Die Hard. I was I grew up in the 80s. Anyway, this this dragon is in charge. And so sometimes I'd be like, oh, yeah, look at me. I've, oh, I've I, now I am in charge of anxiety. And it's like and then it would move. And suddenly, because I was off balance, cocky, off balance, I would then get scared. And then that would immediately turn into fear. And it's like, no, no, no. My only job is to sit with my center of gravity directly like, over my pelvis and just stay. I don't get to be proud of this. I don't and I shouldn't be fearful of it. I can't be fearful. I can't be proud. Just have to be. And I rode the dragon all the way to a safe landing. I don't know if it was 30 minutes. I don't know if it was 45 minutes. It lasted a while. You know, panic attacks can go anywhere from like the, the, the main event can be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. They don't tend to last longer than that, at least in my experience. That was the beginning, not only of my, my education for how to eventually come to stability with this condition. Again, it's not gone. It's just I know how to dance with it. Um, and it was also my education and kind of navigating. This sounds really arrogant, like weird and arrogant, not arrogant, sort of uh, unnecessarily profound, but life itself. That this, you know, I, I, I now have applied it to many other parts of my life where there are two places where you lose balance. One is just fear and not trusting that, that things are not just like blindly trusting things are going to be okay, but like this dragon knows how to fly. You know, it, it is going to be okay. Um, despite how dangerous it seems. And then the other one is arrogance or this illusion of control that in fact one doesn't have in, in many situations, most situations. And when I can tap into that, I am, at, I, I am at peace. I don't, I'm, most of the time I'm not there, but I would say maybe 1% of existence I get to spend there. And that's a lot. If I could get that up to two, three, four, five percent 5%, if I could get that to 10%, it would be, you know, approaching bliss. And I have to imagine that Nirvana is, is just a hundred percent. It's not being out of this world or whatever. It's, uh, as the expression goes, just like being one inch above it, just one inch above the ground is Nirvana. So, you know, for anyone who is going through things, um, I, I would never wish this upon any, anyone. I don't believe that like, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm better for it. Therefore, it's like, no, it was awful. I would rather it not have happened to me. I'd rather I not have done this, got my body to the situation where I went through this. But having gone through it, uh, there is no doubt that it left me with things that there is no way I would have needed and, or, and certainly wanted to um, develop otherwise. So where does that all, where does that all leave us? Um, you know, that basically explains kind of how I got to the place where it's not at all consuming. Um, I hope I've made clear that I don't consider it a point of pride that I did, that I did it without prescribed medication. I, it's just my hangup. I'm all for people taking what they need to take under the, under you know, with expert guidance. Um, and that I really wish that I had tried to help myself earlier. I guess that where that brings me is after I got my job at Stanford, I moved um, my first house. I lived with seven other people. Actually, it was more than that because people had couples. There were couples in there too, but it was this large shared house. I had no money. Um, I couldn't afford to rent anything near school. I, I couldn't afford a car. Uh, and also I was just worried about moving from New York to the suburbs so, so quickly. So I, I lived in San Francisco. I had one room with a bathroom. So that was an upgrade, um, in this eight, eight person house. And a friend of uh, mine who I lived with, um, you know, could tell that I, I mean, he knew I shared openly that each night pretty much I was, I was dealing with this. 
And, um, you know, he also knew that I'm a pretty uptight person, which I am. And he just said, listen, you should, uh, I have a, I have an ex, an ex, uh, an ex-girlfriend, a friend who is a massage therapist and you should go like, and he, and he tried to sweeten the deal by saying, it'll make your work better because <laughs> he knew how, you know, research really matters to me. Teaching really matters to me. Writing really matters to me. It's, it's more than a job to me. It's more than a paycheck to me. It's like, it is really, really matters to me. So he tried to sweeten it by saying like, it'll make your work better. Um, and I did, I started going and one year became another one massage therapist became a therapist therapist. I sort of by recommendation, once I trusted this one person, I trusted their recommendation and I met a therapist who I have been working with, um, for 15 years now, getting close to, if I'm not mistaken, um, maybe, maybe 13 years, I guess. And it was life changing, absolutely life changing. Um, I just wish that I had started sooner. That's all I wish that I, and I wish that we made, not wish, we need to make um, mental and physical health just a regular part of the conversation in within academia, all the way from the undergraduate, heck, from high school onward. And, and not just, again, not just in this crisis mode. Like if you are, if you have, if you are, have um, suicidal ideation and things like crisis management, that needs to be done. But just in general, just in general, the way that we, we talk about what you do when you get a cold or when you get, when you catch the flu or getting a booster shot or getting a flu shot for a seasonal flu shot or, you know, spraining a wrist and like the, the things that we do where no one would think twice about the idea that, yeah, you go to your, you go to your doctor, you go to your clinic, or, or you, you take advantage of what's out there and you know what's out there. Um, if we can integrate mental health into that same regime of normality, a lot of people, countless people would, would benefit in ways that will make their life immeasurably better. And uh, if we want to put this pragmatic twist on, which is fine if we want to, it'll make them better at their jobs and better at their careers and better in their scholarship and better in our studies and better in our teaching. Um, a healthful world is just a better world in which to, to do these things. Because, you know, when you, when you teach, you don't just teach with your head and your mouth, you teach with your whole body. When you think, you think with your whole body. When you write, you write with your whole body. When you, when you come up with new ideas, you do it with your whole body. And if your body is been pushed to the breaking point, your mind breaks. Um, it, it, you have to pay the debt there. You know, it's not eventually the debt collector comes when you, when you, um, when you tax the body like this, I think I'm mixing metaphors, but you get the idea. So there are lots of things that, um, you know, I'm probably leaving out of the story, uh, I mentioned that it was an adult panic attack, my first adult panic attack. And the reason I mentioned that is because as, as soon as I, well, the second time I had it, not the first time I went to the emergency room, but the second time I had it, I realized I, I described it as a nightmare that you are awake for and you can't get out of. Um, I recognized it. I was like, this is familiar. I remember this. Uh, the way I experienced was this sort of empty, planetary scape with no trees or no fixtures, which are these like lines curving into the horizon. If anyone's seen the movie Tron, it's got a little Tron element of it, but it's sort of dusk. You just see kind of either like a setting sun glow in the distance. And, um, and then the only sound is, is the sound, an ad adult voice with a deep, a deep voice. And this, the voice is saying exactly what I am thinking in that state, but at a microsecond or second delay. Pretty, pretty freaky if you if if you're awake for this. And I remember saying to myself, "I've been here before," and I and I realized that I had, and that um, I had had this dream. I had had this panic attack, 
when I was probably five or six. I don't exactly know, but there was this episode of my family where, where um, Tommy was having dreams and, you know, talk about the confusion of it, like trying to explain to your older brother or to your parents uh, and them saying like, did you have a nightmare? And I remember just sort of saying like, yeah, because I, I, I couldn't explain it and I wanted to, I wanted to explain it and I didn't want it to be confusing. And so I just grabbed hold of whatever words they were giving me. And I remember my brother saying like, oh, were there, were there sharks around the bed? Is that why you were scared? And I was like, yeah, there were sharks around the bed, uh, but there were no sharks around the bed and it wasn't a dream. And so, you know, sometimes I think to myself, like if, 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 if this kind of, if mental health was just a more regular run of the mill part of the conversation, like would it have taken me 20 years of life to realize that I had gone through that as a child because of stress, because of, I don't know why. Um, or would I just have known the way I, I know, I, I remember as a kid when I broke, you know, I broke a toe or I broke my foot one time. I, you know, I played baseball. I, I, I remember those injuries. I remember them. There was no mystery about that. I didn't, it's not like I had an x-ray as a 26 year old and someone said, do you realize you broke your foot as a six year old? Um, be like, oh, really? I did. It's like, of course I remember that, uh, but not so with issues of emotional, mental health. Um, it just goes to show like just at a societal level, how much we disavow this part of our existence. Um, and we need to do better. We need to do better. So again, this is just a kind of rambling thing. I'm sure I've lost many of you by now. If you are still here, I appreciate you listening. I hope this has been of help. Um, if you are dealing with anything, seek help. I try, I make sure as in all videos of this nature that you, to include any necessary 800 numbers, if you are dealing with crisis, um, and this is just my experience. It's not, there's no concrete advice about what you need to do. It's just that we need as in academia, we need to regularize these conversations, make them a normal part of our everyday life. Um, yeah. I'll see you in the next video.